Okay, I'm gonna start with this. First of all, it's a huge honor to meet you. Um, for me personally, uh, you've been a role model, and you've been a person that I looked up to for many years as an iwi player, as a short, uh, as sort of a person that you know showed me, among other players, but specifically the things that you did were the things that kind of talked to me as a musician very, very much. I, um, I, uh, I, I follow your music, I followed your music from you know, the early beginnings and especially because I'm a huge fan of uh, Scott Kinsey and oh. his music I, you know, and you're very much involved in his projects yes. um, you know that's, that's outstanding stuff really I mean I'm, I'm, um, I love it, I really do and just to enhance that um, every person that I speak to which is, uh, you know, a serious iwi player, always, you know, tells me, oh, this is that's something that Steven showed me. You better go ask Steven about it. You know, this is something that uh, I learned from Steve back in the day. Actually, you know what? I, now that I think about it, that was not me. That was Steven. Anyway, um, so all roads lead to you in many ways. Um, I love, uh, I love... Getting together with people, Judd and I are kind of like a like a team. And, hmm. uh, and Michael, before he passed away, it was great interacting with him. And, uh, wow. There's a couple of people that you haven't interviewed yet that, you know, are, I'm supposedly their teachers, but I end up being a student. So. Who are they? And I, I like that. And uh, there's one guy, if I can find him for you, he plays the UE different than anybody. He keeps it completely open, plays it with a vocorder. Okay, who is he? I gotta think of his name. Anyway, I, I will get it to you. Anyway, so. So basically all roads lead to you, uh, in, in, at least in my personal journey as, a, as, a, as an EOE player. So I have a lot, a lot of questions that I have here. Um, let's see how we, if we can reach them all. If not, then not. Uh, but maybe just you know to start with, I'm curious to know how did you start with the iwi? Pretty easily. Um, I was in George Benson's band for eight mm -hmm. years when he was on top of the world, and uh, the other saxophone player, David Boroff, who was a session guy for David Foster and all those people, he knew not, he met Niall Steiner before I did. And so he introduced me to Niall, mm -hmm. and uh, Niall built me the prototype. And right. Dave, Dave's, David's was built into a mini mode, and mine was built, he built mine directly into a cord mono poly. Well. So with the computer wired, hardwired into it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so in 1982, um, I think that's about the time that maybe I started started playing it, um, or maybe a little earlier. Um, and then um, David and I turned it on to Michael, and uh, mm -hmm. met him in the street in New York, and said, "Hey, you should play this thing," you know. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And then Judd, Judd having a closer, Michael and I were good friends, but Judd had a very very close relationship with him, and and did more programming for him. But um, okay. and yet, and anyway, so it was really interesting in those days because it was a mono instrument. Um, and uh, then I had a, a pedal board, kind of like guitar players did with, with delays and choruses and things like that. You know, just right. a little six pedal board. And, uh, and that's, that was my rig, especially, uh, I don't know if you were familiar with a group called Dog Cheese that I had. That was yeah, that, that, that rings a bell. That rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, it was Vinnie Pauliuda, Larry Klein, um, Michael. Oh, yeah. Michael, so, yeah. Anyway. But that was my that was my setup for them. And uh, trying to sound like a guitar player, I used to play through guitar speakers. Um, hmm. Stereo. And uh, well, like everything I did, I want to sound like a, at least have the intensity of a guitar player. You know. Mm. So that's how I started. Niall, I would visit Niall probably more than he ever wanted me to. Um, he was he is still a wonderful, wonderful person, no ego, and just totally into the science of the evening. So 
it's, it was, it's, it's a wonderful relationship. Did I hear you say that you started playing it in 82? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was it? On the road. There are videos of live performances with George Benson on the road in the 80s, and you can see me playing Niles, uh, Niles' instrument. I joined George in 1980, and I... I think 1982 is around the time that I, I got it. So you were the first one before Michael? Oh, yeah. By far. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now, I think that Judd had the oldest version of Niles, things called the Steiner Parker. I had the, uh, the, the, the romatized looking, you know, uh, version that Nile built just yeah. for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, wow. and if you couldn't play it, and you couldn't trigger another synth. It was it was hardwired, like I said. Hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, some things about general ideas, um, maybe more towards your programming skills. Um, okay. How do you approach programming in general for the iwi? Is that something that you are thinking ahead? Or trying and you know and discovering things that you like to do, um, or is it? There's there's different facets. I wake up in the morning, and you might say I have the beginner's mind, mm -hmm. which is a Zen thing where you treat things or just discovery, and and the the listener inside me is my is my teacher. So. I see. Uh, I will listen to things, or I'll be inspired by certain things, and uh, and I'll go, well, gee, I'd like to make something like that. And I can get into techniques, what I do for movies and things now, which are pretty out. But um, uh, as far as when I was doing hardware uh, synthesizers for live gigs, mm -hmm. um, it was mainly through me really liking like Jan Hammer and the way they played, or, or Chick. Something like that, right. you know. I'm going, wow, that's uh, the linearity of what they play. They play horizontally. I really love that that way, and I'd love to play like that. Or Freddie Hubbard, you know. Mm. Uh, but then I would program, like I said, playing with one of the best guitar players around and have, having the famously the best sound in, the, in those days, Michael Landau. Uh, mm. I would try and imitate imitate him with tri choruses and crazy flanges and things like that, you know? Right. And, and knowing that I was dealing essentially with a, uh, a mono instrument. You know, right. 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 So, um, but should I go on to what I'm doing nowadays, I just thought, or? Please. Okay, so now what I do is because I'm, I'm doing probably 95% of my work now is, 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 is in, in cinema right. and, uh, uh, sound design for composers. <clears throat> so what I do is I use a program called Melodyne, for instance. Mm -hmm. I have devices that I use. So um, I am lucky to have perfect pitch, whatever that means. I, I joke, I say I have perfect glissando, you know. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I, I think it's actually just tone and memory, to be honest. Um, but I, I will take waveforms and uh, do programmable ring modulation to them, or, uh, or I will take samples of what I just did recently was um, like wind, wind storms, for instance, or something like that, and I would tune them. I would take all the notes and put them into unison in right. Melodon, and then uh, loop it. Uh, Put it in contact or omnisphere. Now that you can import, import your own samples into omnisphere, and I, I would use my um, my techniques for making it work as an iwi program. Judd and I both use uh, SIPS, you know, the SIPS legato mm -hmm. in contact, because before that, when you would play fast, you would get an attack on every single note, and it doesn't sound. You lose. Yeah. That's a realism, you know. Right. Now, when I use, uh, I did a movie called The Exotic Marigold Hotel. And with that, I'm using more of a portamento, so that it's more Indian mm. sounding. 
And uh, so you get more bends, but you don't get that zip kind of ornamental where you go bow, you know, mm -hmm. you know, sound like a cartoon. The nice thing about the Sips Legato is that you get the bend, but then if all once I want to jump an octave and I want to tongue it, it's not going to zip up to there from the last note I play. Mm. So in that way, you get this this um, this fluidity. Again, you lose your you lose your uh, polyphonic ability. Mm -hmm. But for instance, I was doing just finished doing a show for Britain. It's called uh, A Suitable Boy, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a fourteen hundred page book, and for Alex Heffes, the composer, and I'm playing with Anushka Shankar and different people like that. Right. You, I have to have a certain fluidity in the sound that I'm using. Right. And uh, you know, and what I do a lot now is is I will create hybrid instruments. For instance, there might be a Bulgarian vocalist with a string overtone mm -hmm. with a bansery, things like that, or I'll tune I'll tune the wind. I've, I've tuned storms and things like that, and I use that to add breathy things perfectly in tune with, uh, you know, with Beautiful. a regular instrument, a violin or something like that. Yeah. Um, the other technique is, is um, the creating instruments is, is you can do it in Melodyne, you can do it, I use Ableton Live as my, my DAW. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the storm, I'll record a hurricane or something like that. And I'll import that audio into MIDI, and then the MIDI will trigger my own synth sounds that I have. So I mix the hurricane with with maybe an orchestra, but they're all playing the same notes and these things like that. Wow. And then I'll play that on Ewe, maybe do low sustains or um, uh, aleatoric kind of things for the movie like that. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie 1917. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, so yeah. I'm the main soloist and sound designer on that. And, oh, really? And, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Okay. My job is actually to serve the picture and be invisible, you know? So you might know not know what I'm playing when I'm playing on, on the movie. I could be a, a distant a war drum or something like that on the Ewood. So. so mostly working with... Thomas Newman, the composer. Yeah, this I know. Yeah. Pretty much everything he's done in the last 15 years, that's me. Okay. So, 20 years, maybe. Um, mm. Generally, the if you watch his movies and you hear oboe solos and things like that. Okay. The, the oboe, Good. Wow. <laughs> or low brass or a choir, things like that. It's it's all it's all myself. So. Anyway. Okay, I uh, I, I got I got to do some homework, <laughs> but I'm uh, I'm so, very much looking it, forward. Yeah, it's it's, it's, and it's a lot of fun too. I really love it, and he, I like I love working with Tom because um, he's open minded, but he always looking for the new thing, the new turn. We call it happy stance in order, uh, where a happy accident happens, and you could really never have thought of that in the moment to compose that. Right. Because in that place in time, something really cool happened. Um, that's why we like, I like, I've been making patches of sampling band series and different things and having, uh, or, or saxophone overtones, things like that. And having it imperfect, you don't want, I don't want a strong sound all the way through. I want anomalies to be happening. Mm. So it's kind of a loud Tzu where the imperfect thing is the one that works the best. And then in contact, I would have random sample starts so that every time you played, you don't hear it go, boy oh boy oh boy oh you know, so the lick, uh, so I'll have it start in different places in the sample. Wow. Among other things. So. Amazing. You know, when I listen to you, especially with, with Scott, because that's the place where I can right. hear you play uh, live or recorded, um, right. I, there is a difference between how you approach the saxophone and how you approach the iwi. Right. Um, I wonder what, what if you know if there is or what's the type of concept you're thinking when you're playing the iwi. Well, the wonderful thing about working with Scott Kinsey is that he's a genius, first of all, and he's an open-minded genius. Mm. So I would, 
you know, there are times when I play full out solos on the sax or on the Ewing. Um, but more and more as I evolve, I, I consider my solo part of the ensemble. So I, I look at my solos as more as commentary, where we're, where we're having a conversation rather than someone go, okay, now we've got to sit here and plan. So right. I never think from here to there in the notes that I play. I leave spaces because maybe Gary Novak or Vinny or somebody like that might throw something in. And if I'm sitting, oh, I've got, I've got about 10 more notes to play in this lick I know. And, and I would miss the moment, you know? Mm. So I leave more space. Right. It's more commentary. A lot of times I just add the frosting on top, you know? Yeah. And I feel that that's really is enough. Sometimes I'll be a bull and I'll just go for it on alto or whatever, and, you know, and there it is. But um, the more commentary more interplay interesting now with, oh. with the uh, with the iwi i never know what's but i'm I, there's really except for maybe some melodies it's pretty open whatever i want to play so even within a song i'm i might change patches and become someone who is comping mm. kinsey's solo right and um and that becomes fun. You have to be careful because you know you don't want to comment too much. Um, Tom Newman has a little commentary about when we're in the studio, and um, you know less is always better in movies. You got to play mm -hmm. on the dialogue, get your point across, be complex, but the complexity needs to arrive at a simple destination. Complexity needs to to become simple. Hmm. You know, the complexity is the search, you know, but the answer should be simple and, hmm. uh, in my mind. And uh, so you start playing something and then all at once he calls it the hungry tiger. So the tiger gets a little piece of meat and hmm. then he takes another piece and then it gets more complex and you're playing. You end up, you end up playing too much, hmm. you know, and it's more about you than what you're serving. And the nice thing about doing movies, which I brought to the live stage, is that what's your point? What's your story? Um, you can play all the notes in the world, but what's what's your point? What is your what is your intention? You know, what are you trying to say here? Um, those guys play circles. I mean, the, the saxophone players of today absolutely blow my mind. You know, sure. the, the, the techniques. I mean, it's so funny that we all studied, but now they play like Chris Potter, uh, uh, Mark Turner people. The Altissimo register is like like it always existed up there. And <laughs> for me, I used to just kind of power my notes up there and, yeah. and, and use my throat to play the notes. But these guys play like it's the middle octave. And I'm going, gee, I had the same horns. And <laughs> I think we're a product of our time. And um, as Vinny Call, you just said, there's... It's the new sphere, with the Teilhard de Chardin, mm -hmm. where all the knowledge is there and cumulative. So, um, not like people are better because Miles Davis had a voice. Of course, there's guys like that Russian flugelhorn player that, wow, I mean, Miles could never play that, but, but he got his point across, you know? Mm -hmm. Miles was in the early days, probably one of my main influences on you, believe it or not. Mm. Because, I can believe it. I believe it. Uh, well, like my uh, my uh, album, Blue's Blue Tab, mm -hmm. uh, there's a tune called Tsunami, where I'm playing with Vinny and uh, Jimmy Johnson and Mike Landon, Alan Olsworth. And I wanted to achieve this kind of a, an emotional bursts of the solo, not particular notes, but the emotional intensity and burst like when miles used to scream out his high notes and then just kind of do some chromatic kind of things you know mm -hmm. and i'm not copying the notes it's it's just the intention the the, the emotion that i got from it like in bitches brew and things oh, yeah. like that you know the one one blast of sound could uh be sufficient you know and then then there's people like keith jarrett who's my all-time favorite musician uh I 
I try and use to figure how to play freely like he did. And I, I, I got some insights that, that it seems like a lot of people have a certain amount of runs in their slow playing. And then they have another set of runs in their mid playing and another set of runs when they're playing as fast as they can. And Keith Jarrett could slide in between that imperceptibly. Um, and I always wanted to be like that so that there was no, when you're playing as fast as you can, you just don't go, you know, that things are, are sliding between tempos and feels, you know. Mm. Anyway, I'm talking too much, but uh, no, this is this is this is this is great. Thank you for sharing. I sure appreciate it. Um, out of curiosity, if you compare hardware and software, where, which side would you go? Well, for me, software pretty much is is the way nowadays. Right. And if I was a touring musician, and in the old days. I was actually a able to bring a whole PA on the road with me. You know, when I when I toured with John Patitucci, um, mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a stereo set of speakers and a rack, you know, that I could bring plus my horns. And mm -hmm. nowadays, I think the only thing you can probably I, I don't I haven't toured in ages now, but um, it's probably a laptop. <laughs> so yeah, of you course. probably know more than I would. But um, I know that there's great synths out there, hardware synths, yeah. but because of what I do now, uh, I tend to stay inside the computer. You know, right. not that that's better or worse, but it suits my Handy. my situation. You know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a sort of a maintenance? Let's put it this way: a maintenance system for keeping chops on iwi or practicing iwi or like you would do in a saxophone would you do do you have a maybe a different thing for iwi i really should but i don't <laughs> i get up and since i'm a sound i hear sound okay uh, but i i go for sound versus the the the, the, the linearity of the notes you know mm. and i i really should get the facility back but now that I'm doing mostly, unless I'm recording with Jimmy Haslip or somebody like that, um, it's more lyrical playing than you know the hard, amazing jazz playing, the complex mm -hmm. thing. So uh, I should do it more, but I don't. So my maintenance is is being creative and okay. What am I going to do with the techniques that I've got, and how am I going to apply it to mm -hmm. projects? What draws more time um, uh, when you're working? Playing the iwi or making the patches for the iwi? Um, I think it's equal nowadays because I, I have my computer, the sounds in my libraries, I have probably 25, 30 terabytes of, oh. uh, of sounds. So I've imported into Omnisphere probably uh, 100 gigabytes of sounds. And when you figure that you can only play one sound across the whole keyboard, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of sounds. So wow. um, I think there's a problem with having too much. Too many choices can make it really hard to, in a three hour session, decide what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you tend to fall back on the, uh, the, the ones that you know. But in, in, in reality, I think as a saxophone player will play practice or an oboe player will practice the day before. He's got a hard, hard session the next day or something like that. And you're going you're gonna to learn the melody that's maybe really difficult or whatever. And the changes are hard. Uh, I would ask whenever I could the composer or whoever I'm working with, uh, would, where are we going with this? What's the temp? Um, and I will try and put things together so that I'm not sitting there going, uh, mm. let me look through my 30 gigabytes of sounds. It's, it's kind of like, well, today we're, we're black and orange, okay? There's no green, no red. 
And if I know that there's black and orange, then there's then I'm free again. There's no limitation within that limitation. So the problem is, is when they don't know and you have all the colors of the rainbow. So yeah. If that, okay. if that helps at all. Sure. What's your favorite controller to use? Uh, I would say at this point, the 4000S. And I just ordered the EWI Solo. I didn't know that they even discontinued the 4000S. <laughs> so <laughs> when I wanted to order a new one, I, I have the 5000, but there's, uh, if I ever did want to play the internal sounds, you know, Matt, Matt sounds on the 4000S, Matt Trump. Sure. Those are the best things if I am going to play the internal sounds. Now, since, again, I have tons and tons of saxophones, trumpets, French horns, muted, muted bass trombones, everything you can imagine. I, I was an endorser of Roland for the longest time, so they, they sent me their latest one. And um, it, it's just not for me. And I, the WX7 was never for me because... Um, and it was for other people, but the concept of, of having keys that go down to trigger a note is, is it's something for saxophone players, which I also am, but there's, there's really no need to push a key down to get a note. And as fast as you play, it's really, being fast is only the distance between each note. So, if I'm keeping my fingers down low, it, you can play amazingly fast without having to go from here to there, pushing a key down. You, you, you know what I'm saying. So sure. I got used to the um, I got used to the um, the, the 4000s pretty quickly. It was also like Niles' instrument. I think that I've never been asked to do. Well, a long time ago, I did for a Kai. I know that. I know that video. Yes. But um, from that time on, I've never been contacted by him. And um, I think that every look of a person, every generation of a person should be represented. Now, I'm, I'm definitely getting on in years, but one can turn it around and say, I've survived till I'm almost 70 years old by the fact that I played you. You could too. So that it could actually keep your career going for a long time rather than just being in the moment. Because in, in, in reality, I, I played with, on the EWI sessions for everybody from uh, Michael Jackson to, to Roger Waters to, to whoever, Joni Mitchell, you know, and to movies and, and then jazz gigs and things like that. The Ewe can, can can get you through a lot of a lot of different situations, you know, and keep your career going if you're if you're willing to reinvent yourself, you know. Mm. Anyway, so I'm curious. This um, how do the directors actually see the Ewe, this instrument, the capabilities of this instrument in let's say in the, in, the, in film music? How how does they it? Love, they love it. They absolutely love it. And why do they love it? Um, well, let's say I'm doing Finding Nemo or Wally or Finding Dory. I'm doing Pixar. And I'm in a scoring stage with 110 musicians. Um, and I come in to the control room with just the Iwi because I have a wireless MIDI set up from Canada. And uh, that Michael and I both used, and it's called MIDI Jet Pro. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just sit in front of the console and I'd play uh, clarinet solos or, or whatever. And my equipment's 75 yards away. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they love the sounds, they love the expression. You know, on Wally, -E, I, I sampled my whistle. You know, and, I, okay. and when Wally saw Eva, I went, you know, in the evening, the, the director died, you know. Really? Because, yeah, you know, just because I did that or the things you can do to make people laugh and be happy. I, on my record, there's this amazing trumpet player, orchestrator, Walt Fowler. He's one of the Fowler brothers. 
and um, on my record, he, he used to play with Frank Zappa. So they, uh, they, they sampled his voice, just, just little phrases that you would play on the same clavier. So I had Walt say beautiful and yes. So on this one song I, I did on my uh, Blue Tav record, I, I played those on the Iwi and I went beautiful, but use pitch bend. So you go beautiful. <laughs> or, <"Yeah." laughs> there's, there's so many things you can do. So going back to the directors, I haven't met a director yet that didn't like the Iwi. That wasn't, so that's not a real instrument. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. It, because it, it doesn't it, happen in, in Europe. I mean, as well, far as I know. I don't know how many players there are that are actually doing those kind of sessions. Are there? I don't know. I mean, I would, I would, you know, personally would love to uh, take part in such a situation. It's just that, you know, I don't, I don't see it. I don't know. I don't really see it happening yet. Or maybe I'm just, you know, I'm not. I think, I think if I can break in that there's composers like uh, Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor, people like that, that um, they do use acoustic programming, but they also are very synth based also. Mm. So a person that didn't have a gigantic library of French horns and, or me mixing a Bulgarian vocalist with advanced theory, things like that, but had your own uh, outboard gear and your own kind of waveforms if you use, mm. you know, whatever synth you use, you choose to use. Um, I think there's an opening there for sure. I think generally, it seems like there's a lot more originality to filmmaking than the music in the film. And we call it temp death. So whenever someone goes, oh, I didn't like that score, it sounded just like the other one, they also have to realize that the, direct, that the composer's given a temp to follow. And a lot of times, it might be a movie that he did 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and they want it, and, and the directors get married to the sound. So I might have to play like I played on a movie 10 years ago. And mm. critics and people like that don't realize, yeah, and, it, and it comes out good, but you, we just can't do whatever we feel like. Like, oh, I have the sound of a bull crashing through a window, you know. Well, no, that's not what's in the tent. <laughs> I see. You know, wow. anyway. But yeah, I think I think that uh, analog gear, synth gear, the more composers that are synth-based themselves and not just orchestrally based, I think that could be a very happy medium. Hmm. Well, this is de this is definitely something that I'm very much busy with because I, in general, um, tend to feel that you know that hardware still beats software. Um, okay. For me, uh, um, it makes the world go round. Yeah, and and uh, um, I don't really know how to. I don't know. I I have some difficulties with with uh, with digital software. I, it doesn't. I you know it doesn't really feel right in terms of playing and just you know the expression, the fanness of the sound. I must say that I even you know I still own the original Akai's. You know the one thousand, which I love right. dearly, and right. I think they sound amazing. And right. diff, different every time that I take them. I think every generation it sounded worse. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I think you know the uh, the original sounded pretty good. Some of those waveforms were real thick, and you could yeah. really get a lot of expression out of it. And then um, as it moved to the three thousand, uh, I don't know. Something didn't feel quite as good. You know yeah. What I mean? Would you would you still would you do you 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 own them I assume right the original I do ones. I do yeah. yeah do you still play them not really not really I've I've got so many things that I do esoterically no I understand computer. yeah but um but to have a really fat what you're looking for is a fat responsive living waveform mm. you know and I think since it's it's a living sound it's not been sampled it's it's you're creating it as you play uh it's a great thing it's just that um the logistics of what i do is just um it's just not there anymore for me i mean right. i've got so much more that i can bring 
in a laptop and, and a keyboard and right, right, right. Day. But yeah, I think you know whatever serves you. It's it's it's, it's great because for so long I did exactly what you we were doing. I didn't leave it because I got bored with it, but um, just go to different places, you know. Right. I think creativity. I mean, a saxophone is a saxophone. Look how different people play now. And they yeah. Play, I mean, it's there's there's no rules. <laughs> Again. It's what's your story. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I wonder also, um, would you say that by playing the Iwi, uh, something changed in your saxophone playing as well? Absolutely. Um, for a while, it really hurt my embouchure. <laughs> so, um, and also the feel. If I, if I played Iwi for a long time, I, maybe I could get in the stretch where... Uh, I just didn't want to play the saxophone. I want to play Yui tonight, you know? Yeah. It, took, it takes a minute to get it back. It, it definitely does, you know? Mm. So I, with like Kinsey, for instance, you know, I kind of, I mix it. All right. Up. So make sure that I, it's all, it's all there equally, you know? Or else, yeah, it, it, it feels different with the mouth a lot, beyond for sure. And also, uh, we have seven octaves, seven to eight octaves on the Iwi, you're, you're thinking different, just different ways of playing jumps and all kinds of things. Right. So, um, yes, there's a big difference. And I think the Iwi, if you don't apply yourself to your horns, you probably hurt it a little bit. What do you mean? Just just because the embouchure and, mm. and how much resistance you're, you're playing. You know, how, how you set the resistance of your Iwi compared to the reed strength on the on, on your horn, for instance. Do you play? Do you play with hard resistance on your? No, uh, mid, mid, mid. Mid. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just as, as long as I can get what you call niento, which is sound coming from nothing, because I I need to come from nothing for a lot of things. So. Yeah. Hmm. But but if you play a flute sound, they don't hear the air of the flute. In a sample, unless you're playing full lab, you know, mm. 